Ooh. Good morning, brethren, sisters, and church of the living God. Ooh. Ooh, I, we got something today. We got something today. Uh, nice and comfy. Get yourself nice and comfy. Sit yourself in a good chair. Get your authorized version of the scriptures. King James scriptures. Uh-oh. Got two sets of scriptures. Yes, yes. Going to be going through something that uh, the Lord shooed onto your servant today. Um, this this morning, uh, um, the Lord gave me a wonderful chance to have fellowship with a beloved brother. A beloved brother who, when the Lord puts the two of us together, <laughs> uh, things happen. <laughs> things happen. Um, and why don't just... Why well, don't just share this with you, what the Lord uh, showed unto the both of us. Um, so get your authorized version of the scriptures. I'm going to be using two scriptures in this uh, video because we're going to be doing a little bit of an expository video, just a little bit. But um, we're going to begin with one verse of scripture in the book of Romans. Now, we're going to be reading one verse in Romans chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 13. Please, on your own time, before you, before we read this, pause the video, okay? And go ahead and read the context of Romans chapter 14, verse 13. But for the point of this video, we're just going to read the one verse, okay? Because people will... Romans 14, verse 13. Let us not, therefore, judge one another anymore. And people will say, oh, see, you're not supposed to judge. Shh, callate. Be quiet. Okay? Shh. Let us not, therefore, judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Hmm. Mm, stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Hmm. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to 1 Kings chapter 13. First Kings chapter 13. We're going to read this entire chapter. All 34 verses. Oh, oh boy! <laughs> uh, hope you got a little time. And I, I, I gotta be honest with you, uh, dear brethren, Church of the Living God, and even you, mine enemies, and those of you who may stumble upon this. I'm not concerned about your time. I'm really not. I'm not. Okay, I'm not. Uh, if you come, if the Lord leads you here to one of the videos that He has given me on this channel, that He has given me, um, the, you need to invest some time in these videos, okay? Because as you might have noticed, the Lord, um, the Lord gives this to me and it comes out in two hour length videos, okay? I'm not concerned about your time. I'm concerned about where you're going to be spending your eternity. That's where, what I'm more concerned about, okay? I know that most of, uh, most people have the attention span of a gnat and I'm not going to play to that, Okay? I, I, I realize a lot of you have the attention span of a gnat. Hi! Okay? I get that. But if you want some truth, if you want a little food to eat, let's, let's do this, okay? So, 1 Kings chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Now, this isn't going to be verse by verse. We're going to, like, bunch a bunch, of, uh, put a bunch in together and then expound on them like that, but you'll see. 1 Kings chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. By the word of the Lord. So that denotes right away, by the word of the Lord, lowercase w, that the Lord obviously told this man of God to go do this. He gave him instruction, okay? That's what we can take away from that. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. 
Verse 2, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. Okay, so the Lord obviously gave this man of God a mission. It's like, go do this and go say what I told you to say. Okay, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Hold your place there, and go to 2 Kings chapter 23. We're going to look uh, at the fulfillment of this prophecy, okay? Because it says Josiah by name, okay? The fulfillment of prophecy within scripture. 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 15 on to verse 20. Okay? Follow me along. I expect you to. Okay? Follow me along. Now, remember, it says here in verse 2, in 1 Kings 13, he says, Josiah by name. 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 15 on to verse 20. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, the, the, the one we just read about in 1 Kings, okay? And the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. That sticks with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Not in every occurrence, but in a lot of the occurrences that you will see in Scripture about Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that made Israel to sin. Okay, Jeroboam and the system he set up is likened onto Satan and his system, the Roman Catholic system, the Roman Catholic Church, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth, and her army, the Jesuit Order. Okay, Jeroboam and his system is is a type of Roman Catholicism, a counterfeit. Okay, in uh, in uh, Upper Israel, uh, Samaria, and stuff like that. And Dan and the uh, other uh, place, which I can't remember offhand, but he set up idols in one place and the other. And he said, these be thy gods, O Israel, because he didn't want people to go to Jerusalem, where the Lord had ordained for people to go to worship. Okay, but he set up his own little calves, his own gods, and made things after his own mind, after his own hearts. Uh, his own heart and came up with things to deceive the people, hence making the children of Israel to sin. Okay, so that stigma, because Jeroboam the son of Nebat did that, stuck with him. Kind of like with Nicodemus, you know, he's known as the man who came to Jesus by night. Take note of some of the stigmas that you may be branded with. Let's continue. Let's reread that again before I went off on my little rant. Beg your pardon. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both the, that altar and the high place he break down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And Josiah, Josiah by name, Turned himself and spied the sepulchers, not sepulchral, not what do you say, brother? Sepulchers or something like that? <laughs> he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who, prom who proclaimed these words which we just uh, read about in 1 Kings chapter 13, okay? Then he said, being Josiah, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Hmm. So you see two sets of bones here. You see the man, uh, and he said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. 
So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. We're going to be reading about that. So two sets of bones in that one sepulcher. Okay. Like I said, we're going to read about that. Okay. Let's continue. And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. And slew the priests of the high places. That will come into play here a little later. Now, let's continue. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, picking up at verse 3, okay? And he gave him a, and he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jer Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. Okay. Exodus chapter 4. Check this out. Remember, the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Now, note here in verse 4 in 1 Kings chapter 13, it says at the end of the verse, so that he could not pull it in again to him. So his hand kind of like, I don't know, like this or froze up or whatever. He couldn't move his hand or something like that. Okay? Exodus chapter 4, verses 6 on to verse 9. Remember signs. And the Lord, this is talking about Moses. Exodus uh, chapter 4, verses 6 on to verse 9. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again, so that he could not pull it in again. See, in verse 4, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, his hand dried up. Well, let's read it again. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his hand which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. That was also a sign given on to this king, Jeroboam. But let's continue in Exodus, okay? And in verse 7, the Lord says to Moses, after he put his hand in and came out, whoa, white as snow, he says, and he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. So he does one of these. He's like, oh! The Lord said, put your hand in your bosom again. Whoa, okay? And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. We already read that. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take, uh, take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Okay? So we see the Lord gives a sign here, in verse 3, in 1 Kings chapter 13, that the altar was rent and the ashes were poured out upon it. 
Okay, so the renting of the altar and the ashes, boom, falling over. And then we have here, where his hand was dried up. So he couldn't pull it into him again. Hmm. Three signs? Hmm. That's interesting. Let's continue in 1 Kings chapter 13. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So the first two were obviously signs, but this hand being dried up that he couldn't pull it back in again. Very interesting. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Notice this. Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. Very interesting. Very interesting. And remember, the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. You can make the argument, well, they weren't called Jews yet. Jews uh, first appears in the singular form in Esther and whatnot. Okay. The Jews are derived from the line of the Hebrews. Did a two-part video on that that the Lord gave me to do. Okay, there's a two-part that I'll put in this uh, video if I can remember it, okay, about what a Jew is, okay? The line of the Hebrew, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is whence from comes Jew, okay? Because they're the ones that were given the law, the line of the Hebrews, okay? Of Shem. Those of Shem, like uh, those in China, Japan, and uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and whatnot, they are of Shem, but they are not of the line of the Hebrews, which come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And onto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the line of the Hebrew is who was given the law, okay? Okay? But notice here in verse 6, Again, let's read verse 6 again. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, And treat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. Treat the Lord thy God for me. Okay? What does that sound familiar to? You ought to know this. But if you do not, Beg your pardon. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. So, someone who wasn't right with the Lord was asking someone who was right with the Lord to pray for them. Acts chapter 8, verses 18, on to verse 24. Shimon the sorcerer. Acts chapter 8, verses 18 on to verse 24. Read the whole chapter on your own time. And when Shimon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Oh boy. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Why? For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. Now note this. And pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So Peter telling Shimon, you need to pray to the Lord. Okay? You need to pray to the Lord. You need to get right. You need to get saved. Shimon the sorcerer, don't let these wicked devil, Jesuit coadjutor, easy believism, heretics, lie to you. Don't believe their lies, okay? This Shimon guy was not a saved man just because he believed, okay? There was no repentance. There was no brokenness of self. There was no godly sorrow. 
Okay? There was none of that. This man was not saved. Okay? But let's let's continue. Verse 23. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Verse 24. Then answered Shimon and said, Telltale sign of someone who's lost. Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong, obviously, with asking uh, others of the Church of the Living God to pray for you. That, well, that's nothing that's natural. That happens between brethren of the Church of the Living God, obviously, okay? But see, this man, Shimon, was specifically told in verse 22, Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God. He was specifically told. You pray to the Lord. You pray to God. But he asks in verse 24 for Shimon to pray for him instead of him going to the Lord himself. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, verse 6 again in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me. Now, in this dispensation under the law, which was faith and works, the priesthood of the believer that we have today is that we don't have to go to a man in order to go to the Lord because we have the Lord living within us, that circumcision made without hands. We can go to the Father directly ourselves, okay? But under the dispensation of the law, you had to go to a priest. There is that. There is that to consider. But this king, okay, he could have personally, okay, he asked this guy to pray to the Lord for him. But there was no repentance. There was no, oh, wow, I need to go to the Lord myself, okay? Now, granted, there is the dispensational difference thing that you need to keep in mind there, yes. But see, there was no personal affliction there. There was no personal sorrow there. Uh, the, the man of God warned him of things to come. We just looked at it, and it came to pass, and these signs were given to him that it's like, wow, what this guy said is going to come to pass. Okay? And all this king was concerned about was his hand. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? He was just warned and giving, given signs, but yet all he was concerned about was his hand. That was, you know, dried up. Because, and the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. On this, okay, on this, go to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. And as you were, uh, if we were to continue, uh, and we are going to continue, obviously, but when you look into Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he never repented. He never repented. He never, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he's in hell, okay? He made Israel to sin, okay? He never repented. He asked this uh, man of God to pray to God for him just that his hand be restored, even though he was warned of these signs, okay? Asked the man of God to pray for him instead of him personally going to the Lord. Again, remember, there is the dispensational thing to keep in mind, but there was no personal accountability for the warning he was just given about this blasphemous altar. No, he was more concerned about himself, okay? Okay? Just like Shimon the sorcerer. But also, too, after he was restored, this man, Jeroboam the son of Nebat, never returned from his evil ways. Doesn't that sound familiar? Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 and verse 29. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. It's bright out there. The sun came out for a little bit, but um, is there not a spiritual darkness upon this earth right now? This close to the 
redemption of the purchase possession. Okay, the catching away. Not rapture. Okay. Doesn't there seem like there's quite a darkness, a darkness that can be felt today? Hmm? What do you think about this guy, uh, this King Jeroboam, huh? Was there a darkness there that could be felt? This is for instruction and in righteousness, by the way. You do know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let's continue. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. And there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another. Neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. Go ahead, but keep, keep something here so I can control you, see. Yeah. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind, for thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let him, them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself. See my face no more, for in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. Now, this prophet, this man of God, excuse me, didn't see King Jeroboam again. But the point is, this King Jeroboam, he never returned from his wickedness. He never repented. Okay? He was only concerned about himself. Okay? And hence, that stigma, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Example, Nicodemus, the man who came to see Jesus by night. Do you get it? Now, let's continue in 1 Kings, picking up, uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, picking up at verse 7. And the king, <laughs> and the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Give thee a reward, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, what, is the, uh, what does the scripture say about that? Okay. Exodus chapter 23, verse 8. One verse. Exodus chapter 23, verse 8. And thou shalt take no gift. For the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Now, this king, who had no intention of returning from his evil ways, but saw all this stuff, what was his intention of wanting to bribe a man of God? Oh, maybe kind of similar to uh, Balak, the king of Moab, who uh, tried to buy Balaam, the wicked prophet that he was, who was all after was all after the money, that kind of thing. Okay, hmm? was there a similar tie in there? Maybe, maybe. But why was he offering him that? I'll leave that to you to muse upon. But when you got a king who just was given a sign that the altar that he made to make Israel to sin was going to be destroyed, his hand gets done uh, dried up, and he asked the man of God to uh, pray for him, and he himself had no intention of repenting of his evil ways, there was obviously an ulterior motive there. And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. And also, while we're looking at that, go to Proverbs chapter 15, one verse. Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 27. Remember, Balaam, he that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. 
But he that hateth gifts shall live. There's a difference between getting a gift for necessity, for your need. There's a totally, it's a totally different thing to receive a gift for your greed. Remember, our Lord promises you that he will provide your need. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. This two-bedroom apartment, okay, this is a luxury, okay? It really is. Having food and raiment, let us there be you there with content, okay? Providing for your need differs from providing for your greed, okay? There's a big difference there. This Jeroboam, what was his ulterior motive? Hmm? for wanting to bribe this man of God. And note here in verse 8, the fortitude of the man of God from a wicked king who had no intention of repenting. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord. Okay? This man was a man of God. Okay? Obviously, he prayed to the Lord and he restored the guy's hand. Okay? In the very first verse. Okay? And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord. Okay? And in verse 2. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. So the Lord... Our God, our Father, Jesus Christ, okay? Our Lord was obviously talking to this man of God. Okay? We get that. Okay? So, for so it was charged me by the word of the Lord. Okay? He, he had a direct line with the Lord. Saying, eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Uh, you know when the Lord says something, number one, it's set in stone with every pun intended about the Ten Commandments. But what the Lord says goes. And the Lord is very specific about what he gives you to do, what he says unto you. The Lord is very specific, okay? Specificity, okay? The Bibles are not specific. They're, uh, they're full of ambiguity, okay? They're junk. But God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, through his word, the authorized version of the scriptures, okay? Very specific. Ex, uh, Exodus. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Verses 15 on to verse 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Uh, hey, wait a minute. Check, check your version of the scriptures. He didn't say anything about touching it, did he? <laughs> no, he didn't. But see, and right there, those couple of verses show you that in the very first dispensation of the scriptures, it was works. <laughs> you t there was no faith involved in the very first dispensation of the scriptures, dear people. Faith alone in every dispensation? You're insane. You're crazy. You're, -hoo -hoo, you're nuts. Okay? They, they, they heard the voice of the Lord God Walking in the garden. How does a voice walk? Unless there's a body. Okay? They didn't need faith in the very first dispensation, people, because they saw God with their eyes. Okay? They didn't need faith. It was works in the Garden of Eden. Beg your pardon for that rabbit trail. Okay? But our Lord was very, <laughs> very specific, wasn't he? 
Look at, look at, don't look at me. Look at verse 17. But, okay, like, see, you can all eat that. Remember the, uh, how I talked to you about the thing about the red button? You know, all these buttons on the console are good to touch, but whatever you do, don't touch that red button. What happens in you? You want to touch the red button right away. Why? Because your flesh wants you to do that, to disobey what you've been told. That's called the Adamic nature, the old man. Okay? But God is very specific. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's very specific, isn't it? Uh, another thing on this, go to Exodus chapter 25. Okay, Exodus chapter 25, not Numbers, Brad, we'll get to Numbers. Exodus chapter 25. See, God is specific. And what these disgusting Christians want to do is make God not specific. Watered down. God has a very specific way that you are to come unto him that he may save you. But what do these heretics do? They go up another way. God is very specific. Come to him on his terms. Broken of your self-righteousness. Sorrowful, godly sorrow, which lost people can have. Remember, godly sorrow is a two-edged sword. Two edges, not one edge, okay? Two-edged. Lost people can have godly sorrow. Obviously, they of the church of the living God can have godly sorrow, obviously, okay? It's a two-edged sword. But you've got to be broken of your self-righteousness. Godly sorrow, it's your fault, okay? And the fear of the Lord, which will <laughs> ought to lead you on to calling upon his name for mercy, for forgiveness, okay? God is very specific. He's specific. It's not watered down. I ask you, hotshot, is this silent on anything? Anything. Well, it's not specific. Really? God's not specific. He leaves gray area? Hmm. Really? I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Is there gray area in Scripture? Where God doesn't mention anything? That's an argument of these textual, yea, has, hath God said Jesuit coadjutor devils. That's part of their argument. Well, God doesn't specifically say, well, maybe not specifically a certain word or something, but if you look in the scriptures as led by the Holy Ghost, um, this book, dear friend, is silent on nothing. The scriptures are silent on nothing. God is very specific. Exodus chapter 25, verse 40. And look that thou make them after their pattern which was shewed thee in the mount. God is very specific. Hmm? He's very specific. Extremely specific, as a matter of fact. Okay? And now go now to Numbers chapter 22. Okay? Again, more of the specificity of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? Numbers chapter 22, verses 7 on to verse 12. Speaking of Balaam, okay? And the elders of Moab, and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Now, Balaam was the prophet for hire. Okay? He loved money. This man of God was not a prophet for hire, obviously. But note how he refused the man of God rejects the king's offer saying, hey, the Lord told me, the Lord was specific, and he said to do this, I'm sticking to it. Balaam did that at first. We all know about that. We'll touch on that in a little bit, but let's continue, okay? Verse 8, in Numbers chapter 22. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, 
and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam, and said, What men are these with thee? Did God know what those men were? Of course he did. He was giving Balaam a chance to be like, Okay, I know what's going on. Remember! What, what do you, what do you easy believism devils, you heretics, what do you like to say as your defense? God knows my heart. Yes, he does. He knows everybody's heart. We'll look at that too over here a little bit too, okay? But yes, he does. So just like in the Garden of Eden, he's giving Balaam a chance. He knew who those guys were. He wanted Balaam to say to him, uh, who are those guys? Okay, let's continue. And God said unto Balaam, and God came unto Balaam, excuse me, and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Sippor, king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for thou art blessed. Now note the differences. There are two things in this. He says first, And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Specific. Don't go with them. We'll, we'll touch on that. We'll touch on that. Chill. Don't get ahead of me. Okay? We'll touch on that. But he says first, don't go. Specific. Number two, thou shalt not curse the people. Specific. For they are blessed. Okay? God was very specific. Don't do this. Like I said, we're going to touch on that, that he goes, we'll, we'll touch on that. Don't worry. Okay? But the point is that we're getting at specificity. God, when he tells you to do something, do it. God, when he says something to you through the scriptures, being led by the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit, okay, who's guiding you through the scriptures, he says for you to do something specifically, stick to it, boy. You know, stick to your guns. Stick to your guns. That's the point, okay? Now, let's continue uh, beginning at verse 11, okay? In uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. Verse 11. Now, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. Note, too, the difference. Man of God, prophet. That is to be noted. The significance, but it is to be noted. The scriptures make a specific point, and this man of God is not named. We just know him as the man of God. Neither is this prophet named. Remember, there were two sets of bones in that grave that Josiah that we already looked at, two sets of bones, okay? Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. I beg your pardon, brethren. Okay? Okay. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And he went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said, Now, now pay attention to this. And he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Come home with me and eat bread. Hmm. Uh, very, very interesting, huh? And he said, And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord. Pay attention. Okay? We've, we've already established. Word of the Lord. That appears what? This is now the third time, right? 
no, fourth time, third or fourth time, the word of the Lord unto this man of God, uh, specifically, okay? God was specifically speaking to this man. God specifically gave this man instructions, okay? Note, and he said unto me, and he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, note that, thou shalt not, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by, to go by the way that thou camest. Specific, okay? Now check this out. Pay close attention. Okay, pay very close attention to this. And he said unto him, the old man, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. You see that? But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Mm. Now, in verse 18, verse 17 and 18, did you catch that? Did you catch that? Let's look at that again. I, I'm assuming you did, but just in case you did, okay? You're just sitting there not following along in the scripture, listening. Let's go through it again, okay? Verse 17 and 18. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, specifically in direct communication, this man of God was, okay? Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. Simple! Specific! Do what I say! He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. As thou art. Um, the scriptures calls this man a man of God. A prophet as thou art? Now the man of God did prophesy. Yes, he did. Absolutely he did. But the distinction, he was a man of God. The scripture calls him a man of God. But this old prophet was liking him, him that, hey, we're the same. He even calls him brother here, okay? Not here, but coming up. He refers to him as brother, okay? He said unto him, I am a prophet as also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Hmm. Okay. Genesis chapter 3. Oh, come on. Uh, does that not scream to you? Genesis chapter 3. Okay. Does that not scream to you? Okay. Genesis chapter 3. Verses 1 under verse 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. That's Satan he's talking about, okay? And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. We already looked at that, so we won't get off on that. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. <laughs> he said unto him, I am a prophet as thou also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. I, you already got that figured out. I know you have. I just had to say it, okay? No marvel if his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness. I just bradized that, beg your pardon, okay? Let's continue here in Genesis. 
For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yea, hath God said? An angel spake unto this prophet, while the man of God, direct communication, but an angel spake unto this guy? You know, this, this old prophet, I don't think he was evil, but he said an angel. An angel? Hmm, angel. Uh, no marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Come on, fingers, work with me. Not against me. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 1 on to verse 4. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, <laughs> lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity. It's simple. Salvation is simple. Come to him on his terms. Broken, contrite, fear the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord. It's not that difficult. The hard part is getting over yourself, tough guy. Hot shot. Yeah, that's the tough part. Okay? Hence the Lord breaking, you know, the breaking process, which you need to go through in order to be truly saved by him. He's the one who saves you, okay? Going to him on his uh, conditions and stuff, okay? Let's continue. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, something other than you have heard, hmm, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. While we're here, verses 13 on to verse 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of lights. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. This prophet here, I believe he was deceived. Obviously. And we're going to see the proof of that. Absolutely going to see the proof of that. But note here, but he lied unto him. He lied unto him. Now, you can make an error, but it's a totally different thing when some arrogant hotshot accuses you of lying. That's a totally different thing, okay? Because where does, where do lies come from? Where do lies come from? Well, let's go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. Why? Because his heart is puffed up. He will be as God. Okay? He speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And John chapter 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Oh, oh did I, did I, uh... oh, no, 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 no. John chapter, excuse me, 14. Okay, so Satan is the father of lies. 
Okay? Satan is the father of lies. And it says right here in our text in 1 Kings chapter 13, but he lied unto him. Now, this prophet said an angel spake to him. Who was that angel? When the, this man of God was having direct communication with the Lord, but yet this guy who's saying himself to be a prophet, saying an angel spake unto him in the word of the Lord, who is that angel? And it says here that he lied unto him. Hmm. A devil? The devil? Mm -hmm. John chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The way. Verse uh, 17. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. The Lord in his specificity gave this man of God a way to go. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, the life. Specific. Exclusive. Yes. Very exclusive. Okay. Quite exclusive. Okay. But he is the way, the truth, and the life. The man of God, he should have stuck to his guns with what the Lord said to him. But someone who was deceived by an angel came up to him it's like hey i'm like you god told me to an angel to come on with me conflicting with what the man of god had um had been told specifically and you got to also remember too brethren first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 verse 21 one verse first john chapter 20 uh first john chapter 2 verse 21 uh, 20, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. And see, this started out with verse 15. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And an angel had spake unto this prophet, this prophet was not innocent because he fell for it. But uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 7, anybody? Come home with me and eat bread. Yeah. Come. Come on. Proverbs 7, verses 21 under verse 27. Now, this is a male, a man, obviously. But you, 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 you ought to get where we're going with this. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. It's too, too good to pass up. He goeth after her straight, straight way, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. And of course, as we did in the previous, uh, one of the previous videos, Proverbs chapter 4, verses uh, 25 under verse 27, which is what this man of God should have done. Let thine eyes look right on. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left, Remove thy foot from evil. So, the point is, brethren, when you got some guy coming to you, saying to you, I, I'm like you. The Lord told me to tell you. And it's contrary 
to what you know the Lord said to you, specifically, what he gave you to do. But yet you got some guy saying, the Lord told me. You're supposed to be suspect of that. And search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Why do you think I'm always telling you to, hi, examine yourself. Examine yourself daily, hotshot. Hmm. Do you do that? Or are you too busy? Hmm. You're too busy. Mm -hmm. Now, very quickly, go to Numbers chapter 22 while we're here. Because we, we, we talked about this, okay? Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. I, I know a lot of you are like, okay, about Balaam, okay? But, but Brad, okay, yeah, the Lord was specific. He said for him not to go. But he, he went anyway. But Numbers chapter 22. Uh, two. Here's a little rabbit trail for you on this. Verses 20 under verse 22. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Now look at verse 12 in Numbers chapter 22. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Done. But then he says, Thou shalt not curse the people. For they are blessed. And uh, I forget which video it was recently that I, we covered this um, about Balak and Balaam, you know, Balak wanting to go up higher and higher to try to win over the Lord. I forget what video that was. That wasn't the previous one, but it might have been the one before. I uh, can't remember. I can't remember. But anyway, okay. Thou shalt not curse the people. Balaam never cursed Israel. He never did. Uh, God forbade him from doing so. Absolutely he did. But then again, when we just looked here in chapter, uh, verse 20, And God said unto Balaam at night, and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning, and saddled his ass, and went with the princes of Moab. Now verse 22. And God's anger was kindled again, kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. Now we're going to stop right there, okay? Now, those who are not of the church of the living God, those who are infiltrators, coadjutors, and lost people are like, whoa, dude, this is just riddled with contradiction. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. We're going to say why, okay? As this man, this man of God, okay? Obviously, what we know, genius, this is before 1 Kings chapter 13. The point is, God gave Balaam specific instruction. And then in verse 20, he's like, okay, if they come to you, go ahead. But what I tell you, you better speak. And then in verse 20, God was like mad at him. But didn't he just give him the go ahead? In verse 20, well, what's going on? Genesis chapter 6. Simple. Simple. Uh, remember how we looked uh, about in the Garden of Eden? God said to, you know, told them, all the stuff you can go ahead and eat and touch and whatever, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't touch that. Uh, he didn't say, excuse me. I beg your pardon. He said, don't eat of it. He never said, don't touch it. Beg your pardon for me saying that. Forgive me. I'm sorry for that mishap on my, uh, on my part. He said, don't eat of it. It was Eve who added to the scripture and said, don't touch it. Okay. It's like, you can go ahead and eat everything else, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of it. What happens? Satan comes to Eve, deceives her. What happens to this man of God? A prophet comes to him by the word of an angel who is speaking, apparently, <laughs> the word of the Lord, contradicting, okay? And of course, we, as we know, Eve went ahead, took the fruit, ate of it, gave it to Adam, and everything got done messed up, right? Okay? Genesis chapter 6. 
Because of that disobedience, because of that disobedience, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. See, God knew that Balaam was lusting after reward. He wanted the money. Okay? And they came to him a second time. And God knew that, God knew, of course, that Balaam was going to go. He knew that. And he didn't stop him. He's like, okay, you're going to go. But yet he was angry because God gave him specific instructions not to go as he gave this man of God. But see, God knowing, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. See, God gives you a command, uh, instructions to follow. He expects you of the church of the living God to follow it. But see, we're, we're in the skin suit. Our spirit, our soul are in the skin suit. And it's a war uh, against the spirit and the flesh every single cotton-picking day. It's a war against the spirit and the flesh, okay? We fail daily, unfortunately, okay? God knew that Balaam was going to do that, okay? He gave him a specific instruction. He knew that Balaam was greedy for reward uh, after filthy lucre. And he's like, okay, you're going to go anyway. Go ahead. But see, he was mad because he was a prophet. Balaam was a prophet. And God specifically spoke to him, warning him not to go. Okay, We're not bringing up about the cursing thing because Balaam never did curse Israel. Okay, But see, it's not a contradiction. God said, don't go. But God knew because of verse 5 here in Genesis chapter 6, man, what does it say? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Yeah, God knows your heart. It's evil. God knows everybody's heart. But we know that. Okay? And see, Balaam's heart was after reward. And this man of God, who first said no to a king, but someone coming in, who was supposedly of his own, who, oh, who they say they are of us, but they're not of us, saying, I speak for God. And by that, he was deceived. Went after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter. She forced him, deceived him. So God knew that about Balaam. He said, go ahead. But he was specific to say, what I tell you, that's what you say. And he was mad at him because it's like, I told you not to do this. And I knew you were going to do it anyway. Go ahead. Go ahead. And he was, he was had every right to be indignant. It's not a contradiction. Not a contradiction at all. It's a testimony of man as a fallen being. That man is not good. No matter, even if you, I mean, you got to remember, if you are of the church of the living God, you're still not good. There's none good but one. Who is that? God. There is nothing good in you that is in your flesh. You're not good. The only good that you have about you of the church of the living God, that Jesus Christ is in you. That's it. You as man, no good. And that's the point. That's why that is no, that's not a contradiction, dear friend. Be aware of that. And also, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, a little bit more on Balaam, okay? A little bit more. And <laughs> God used him. God, hey, hey, God spake through an ass. God used Balaam to bless Israel, to kind of counteract Balak. I can't remember what video that was in that we talked about that. I'll, I'll try to remember and put it in the description box. But look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, let's read uh, verses 13 and on to verse 16, okay? In Revelation chapter 2. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. 
And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Don't look at me. Look at the scripture, okay? Who taught Balak to cast a, as we began this video with, stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Stumbling block. And when you read about uh, Balaam, what he did, the daughters of Moab to go to make themselves look appealing to the children of Israel. You know, that's where the, the uh, Phinehas jabbed uh, the Cosby and whoever threw with the javelin, okay, in the tent before Moses and whatnot, okay, because of what Balaam instituted, okay. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Hold yourself above everybody else. You're up here. Everybody is down here. Careful with that. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So, that's a little bit about Balaam there, okay? It wasn't a contradiction. God knew what he was going to do, and God gave him a specific thing, knowing that Balaam wasn't going to do it because he was a prophet for reward. He loved the money, okay? And he gave him, it's like, you're going to go anyway, because God used that to, uh, for number one, uh, all things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, okay? We have it for our example here in the scriptures, but also he used Balaam to bless the children of Israel as well, okay? So that's not a contradiction about that. Just wanted to clear that up. Sorry for that little rabbit trail. Now let's continue from verse 20 now in 1 Kings chapter 13, okay? Note too, again, like we had said, that this man of God was very quick to say, you know, to <laughs> on to King Jeroboam. But when someone coming in, speaking smoothly by an angel, when the man of God was speaking directly with the Lord, okay, who was also one of us, I'm like you, God told me to tell you, uh, you charismatic Pentecostals, uh, this ought to be a pretty good rebuke unto you, dear friends, okay? Okay? You trust the Lord. You, you pray to the Lord. You seek the Lord. You read the scriptures. You, hotshot, examine yourself every single day. You, you do that, okay? You go to the Lord. You search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Okay? Yes, God will speak to you through other people. But until the Lord confirm it to you personally through the scripture and someone coming up to you, well, the Lord told me to do this and it contradicts totally with what the Lord already told you, showed you through the scripture, eh, warning, <laughs> warning. Okay? Now let's continue. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Now, remember how we looked at Balaam a little bit? Okay? Balaam was in sin. Balaam made the Lord angry. He was going to kill him. But yet, God still used Balaam after he had done wickedness, disobeyed the Lord, what the Lord had told him. This old prophet lied, and lies come from Satan. Okay? But check this out. Look at how the Lord uses this old prophet who did this. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord. Now hold on, mouth of the Lord. Again, can't stress this enough. The man of God was hearing directly from the Lord. Directly. You, today of the church of the living God. You are hearing directly 
from the Lord through the scriptures when you read it. Okay? That's, this is how he speaks to you, through the scriptures. Okay? He can speak to your heart, yes. Um, is it possible that the Lord can speak audibly to, some, audibly to someone? Maybe. I'm not going to put that out of the equation. But it's personal. Personal relationship. And see right here. For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord. Because the Lord was speaking directly to this guy. And hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee. But came amiss back and has eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. So because this man of God didn't specifically do what the Lord had told him, kind of like Balaam, and they killed Balaam with the sword. Children of Israel killed Balaam with the sword, by the way. Okay? Um, because he didn't do that, he says, uh, Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. And look who warned him, who told them of that, the one who lied to him about it. Isn't that interesting, huh? Isn't that something? Let's continue. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he, whom he had brought back. On a personal note, just personally, I want to throw this in here about verse 23. You know, Saul, when he was told that you're doomed, you're, you're going to die, Saul refused to eat. But the witch at Endor is like, come on, eat, you know, you know, eat and drink for tomorrow you will die. In his stead, I don't know if I would have been able to eat. But they're again taking into consideration, he was just told in verse 22 by a prophet that lied to him that he was going to die pretty much. It's like, well, this is my last meal. Just wanted to put that in there uh, for you to chew on a little bit. You see, this is why obedience unto what the Lord tells you to do is so imperative. Okay? And obedience unto the scriptures is something that all the heretics want to stir you away from. And go after the traditions of men. Verse 24. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way, and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. Oh, we, we got to, this isn't part of the notes, but we got to, 1 Peter chapter 5, come on, come on, 1 Peter chapter 5. <laughs> ah, Brother Jeff, you see this video? You know why I'm not answering your call. I love you, brother. <laughs> um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Look at verse 24. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Let's read verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Very interesting, huh? Uh-huh. Let's continue. Verse 25, 1 Kings chapter 13. And this great. Uh, this is this is something that the Lord showed uh, showed both of us, myself and a brother, this morning. Uh, this is beautiful uh, verse. To praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they told came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, "It is the man of God." who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. 
Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion which hath torn him, and slain him according to the word of the Lord which he spake unto him. So see, this old uh, prophet lied unto him because he was deceived. Okay, I believe he was deceived. And then the Lord's like, hey, okay, you, you did this. And then he spoke to him for real, <laughs> this old prophet, onto the man of God, telling him, it's like, look, you, you trust the scriptures. I, I could give a rat's rear end if you got 20 people telling you to do something. If you know, if you know, if you know. That the Lord has given you something specifically to do. And you're being obedient onto it. And you got a bunch of putzes coming around. Trying to mess it up for you. But you know. What is man going to do to you? Hot shot. Huh? What is man going to do to you? If the Lord is truly behind you. You follow what the Lord has said. No matter what, search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. What is man going to do to you? What is man going to do to you? You looking at me? What is man going to do to you? They're going to kill you? That's all they can do. You know that better than I do. Hmm? What are they going to do to you? What are they going to do? Any of you, of the church of the living God. The Lord has given you something specific to do. And unless he show it to you, huh? unless he rebuke you. Now granted, again, the Lord can use brethren to rebuke you as he does. But, you know, when you got brethren rebuking you, it's like, hey, brother, you need to consider this. How do you respond to that? <laughs> Search the scriptures daily. Like when, uh, you know, with the whole uh, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh thing with me, okay, a while back. Brethren were like, uh, hey, Brad, there's something not right with that. Okay, why are devils able to say it so freely? Uh, maybe we're misinterpreting. You know what I did when I was rebuked by that, by the brethren? I did what? I went and searched the scriptures whether these things were so. Okay. So when you got brethren rebuking you, go to the scriptures. And if it's a rebuke, and if it's of the Lord, he will show it to you. If they're full of hooey, trying to get you to go astray, the Lord will show it to you. You search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so. Do you understand? Okay? Let's continue. Verse 27, and he spake to his sons. Uh, did we skip verse 26? No, he didn't. And he spake to his sons, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass nor torn the ass. The Lord's like, You two play nice. I'm making a point here. What was going on? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little opinion here, and uh, the, the Lord guide you in this too. Go to Deuteronomy chapter eight. See, Deuteronomy chapter eight. Oh, and brother, it was Deuteronomy chapter eight, not Deuteronomy chapter three. <laughs> or, or I said to you four this morning. Sorry about that. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 on to verse 6. You know, why did God tempt Abraham? God doesn't tempt anyone. I'll, I'll, I, I wrote that one down. That will be in the description box of this video. But Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 on to verse 6. Remember what we've been talking about and looking at today. Okay? All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. 
dispensationally, this is different. But this is for instruction and in righteousness. Okay? Let's continue. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Now hold up. Who is God to re revealing to know what was in thine heart? Hold your place here. Okay, uh, uh, go to First Kings. Okay, First Kings. Uh, what is that? Uh, First Kings chapter eight. We'll use this one. First Kings chapter eight, verse thirty-nine. One verse there. First Kings chapter eight, verse thirty-nine. First Kings chapter eight, verse thirty-nine. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and do, and give to every man according to his ways. Whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all, all the children of men. Yeah, bravo, bravo, yeah, God knows your heart. Do we need to go back over to, well, we're here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 again. And uh, do we have to go to Jeremiah? We might as well. Why not, huh? Huh? Well, why not? Repetition is a good thing. Repetition is a good thing. So, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, yeah? God knows your heart. Yeah, he does, genius. He sure does. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. See, that's why brokenness of self-righteousness is imperative, a requirement to God saving you. Okay? It's imperative. Because if you forego that and are a thief and a robber and go up some other way, come on. But you... God knows your heart. He sure does. He sure does. And of course, while we're on this little rabbit trail, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17. I'm going to beat this in your head. Okay? Yes. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. What verses? Come on, you know this. 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And, okay, and also uh, John chapter 2. John chapter 2. What are you doing? John chapter 2. <laughs> Beg your pardon. One verse in John chapter 2, verse 24. John chapter 2. Come on, fingers work with me. John chapter 2, verse 24. Verse 24 and 25, beg your pardon. John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Why? Because he knew all men. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was, what was in man. What's in man, dear brethren? Let's go to Romans chapter 3. What the easy believism devils, these heretics, these Jesuit coadjutors, what they hate, what they love to skip over. Because it gets personal with you, boy. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 18. God knows you're hot. As it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. 
and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what's in you. That's what's in me. But see, the Lord broke me of my self-righteousness. And I came to him broken, contrite, because I put him on the cross. I held the hammer that put the nails in his hands. I held the hammer that put the nails in his feet. I put the crown of thorns on his head. It was my fault. And because it was my fault, it is my fault, I deserve to go to hell. But see, in that process, the Lord broke me and I cried out unto the Lord for his mercy. I called upon the name of the Lord and he saved me. Dear friend, if you are watching this, whoever you are, if you are lost, if you're an easy believism devil, if you're a love gospel devil, okay, if you're a wicked lordship salvationist devil, you're not going to get away from this. You have to wrestle with this. You need to be broken. You cannot be broken. You cannot be fixed until you are broken. What, what's the point of fixing something if you ain't busted? Please understand that. Okay? But now, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Forgive me, that little rabbit trail. We, we do that. We do rabbit trails together, don't we? <laughs> don't we? I love rabbit, especially with teriyaki sauce and hot sauce. Uh, more so teriyaki. You mix teriyaki and uh, hot sauce together, and then you put it on the rabbit meat and on the grill, and then you get that good smoke going with some hickory. Oh, very delicious. I like that. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Go back there. <laughs> okay? Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 3. Well, let's reread again, shall we? All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no, so that you will know whether or not you're going to keep God's commandments whether or not you're going to do what he says. Revealing to you that you are incapable of saving yourself. Revealing to you where your heart is. God knows your heart. He absolutely does, yes. Do you know your own heart? You don't even know your own heart. Don't give me this nonsense that you do. The only thing about your own heart that you need to know is that it's desperately wicked and that you can't trust it. You believe in your heart that you're righteous. huh? You believe in your heart, I don't sin anymore. You believe in your heart that you're saved because you saved yourself by your belief that God loves everybody, that there's something good in you worth saving. You don't know your own heart. You don't know. Guys who say God knows my heart they don't know, even know their own selves. That they're wicked. This is to reveal unto you your own heart. Because God already knows it. Let's continue. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Told him not to eat or drink anything. This man of God in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, right? Okay? Okay. And fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only. Come on, read it with me. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. God will provide for your need. God will provide for your need. We can testify to that. Some of you can testify to that. If you're of the church of the living God, what you ought to. 
Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And the Lord says in the book of Revelation, Whom the Lord loveth, whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. If you don't have the Lord's chastening in your life, oh boy. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. And to fear him. Hmm. Second Chronicles, chapter 32, just one verse. King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, who was, who was a man of God, greatly used of God, but got puffed up in his heart because of his blessings and was more thankful for the blessings than the blesser. Yes. Yes, a man of God, a godly man was King Hezekiah. Amen. But he got arrogant. He got puffed up. He started showing to the enemy all the stuff that he was given when he should have kept his mouth shut and kept that stuff private to himself. But no, look at how the Lord has blessed me with all the stuff I got. Okay? Yeah. And then, okay, Second Chronicles chapter 32, one verse. Verse 31, you don't know your own heart. Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. Now this just does not happen today, because if you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You have that circumcision made without hands, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that Spirit dwelling within you. Okay, you're not going to lose your salvation. Okay, this is <laughs> instruction in righteousness. Okay. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. God knew what was in Hezekiah's heart. We've already proved that. That Hezekiah, who was puffed up because of all the stuff that he was given, he was given a second chance, and those 15 years which came Manasseh, and did you read about King Manasseh, who I believe is in heaven, absolutely. You get puffed up over the blessings, just like King Hezekiah did. Yeah. King Hezekiah, he didn't know what was in his own heart. The Lord left him. That doesn't, you know, uh, the Lord can go silent to us. The Lord can hand us over to the destruction of the flesh. He won't leave us if you're truly saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus. He ain't leaving you. That ain't going to happen. Okay? But he can sure. <laughs> it's like, okay, go ahead. Give yourself over. Kind of like what happened with Balaam. Hmm? Kind of like what happened. Do you get the point? Okay? You're not being obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, through the scriptures. Okay? You're going to do what you're going to do. But he's going to punish you. This man of God. Have it, any of you ever fasted before? You know what happens? How weak you get? How your stomach gets to grumbling? How your mouth, that that taste in your mouth without having food or water for over 24 hours, you know? That's why if you do fast, you, you know, I always tell you, always carry a sword on you. You know, even if you're in your living room or whatever, you're fasting, it's like, oh Lord, I'm so hungry, I just want to drink. And that, the, that nasty taste in your mouth you get from fasting, not eating or drinking water. If you've ever done that, you know what I'm talking about. You know, but you're sitting there, oh, I just, Lord, Lord, help me, <laughs> help me, <laughs> comfort me, <laughs> you know? This man, this man of God was given a specific duty. Don't do this. And there were many variables. He refused the king. 
What was the king's motives? Trying to buy a man of God? Don't know. But someone who is claiming to be of himself, of his own, himself who was deceived, tricked him. But see, this man of God, the lesson is, if someone comes to you, like we already looked at, you know, kind of like with the uh, in the book of Joshua, when the Hivites or the uh, the Gabeonites came to him, it's like we become from a far country, right? And they just took it. They didn't go to the Lord, brethren. Do you think it says in vain? Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so, to examine yourself every day? You think that says, what is that, that, just to amuse you? Or do you take it literally? Do you take it seriously? I, I do. What about you? What about you? Hmm? You appreciate a rebuke? I do. I do. I appreciate a, rebu a rebuke. I love them. Why? Because... We can be blinded to our own shortcomings. Absolutely we can. But see, when you get yourself a little up here, who can rebuke you? Let's continue. Let's continue. I think you got the point on that. Let's continue from verse 29 in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave and they mourned over him saying, Alas, my brother. And it came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his son saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried, lay my bones beside his bones. And where was that? That was in uh, 2 Kings, right? 2 Kings chapter 23, go back there. 2 Kings chapter 23. Uh, uh, where was that? 2 Kings chapter 23. Ah, yeah, verse 18. And he said, let him alone, let no man move his bones, the man of God. So let his, let them, so <laughs> they let his bones alone, the man of God, with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Beg your pardon. So the two sets of bones in that grave that we looked at in the beginning of this video. And it came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the high houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. And we already looked at it that they did. And note again here in verse... 30, and he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, saying, Alas, my brother. Comparing that with verse 18. Like I said, this old prophet, I don't think he was evil or anything like that. He was deceived. He lied to him. He was deceived. And even though, just like Balaam, this old prophet was deceived, God used this old prophet to rebuke and warn the man of God. <laughs> hey, guess what? You didn't do it my way. You're going to die. Kind of like how it says in Romans chapter 6, you know. Um, go there, of course. I, I expect you to, obviously. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. Verse 21 in uh, Romans chapter 6. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death.
when you don't do it God's way, it will lead to your death. It will hasten that day. Now let's wrap this up, shall we? Verses 33 and 34 in 1 Kings chapter 13. Now note this. King Jeroboam. After this thing Jeroboam returned not from his evil way. Returned not from his evil way. He was warned by the man of God. The altar was rent and the ashes poured out. And he had his hand dry up. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way. He never did. But yet, he wanted to give the man of God a reward. Hmm. Hmm. But made again of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, whomsoever would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. So, whoever would, I, I'm, I'm a preacher. So you're going to just turn on the computer and blah, 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 not being led of the Lord? What, you, the, the charismatic Pentecostals is a perfect example of this. How many of these twits, um, and uh, by the way, um, if you're sincerely been delivered out of the Pentecostal system, praise the Lord to you. Uh, may the Lord reveal to you how wicked the Pentecostal system truly is. Okay? You know to who I'm referring. But, um, you know, the Pentecatholics, the Care Catholics and stuff like that, how many of these guys come up saying, God has spoken to me, God has spoken to me, I got a word for you. I, I'm a prophet, I'm a self-ordained prophet. How many people uh, say, well, I'm, I'm called to ministry? There are very few people who have actually been called to ministry. I fought the Lord. Oh, boy, did I fight the Lord. But see, he took everything away from me in order to establish me right here to do what he wanted me to do. This is his. This is his. This belongs to him. Yeah, you're right. Paul said, my ministry. Yes, he did. He sure did. Uh-huh. But... Did Paul harp on that? No. Yeah, it was given on to the person of Paul because God counted him faithful. Okay? And then again, you got to remember, Paul did struggle, uh, struggle mightily with pride. But see, he was given a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. This is the Lord's ministry. But see, Jeroboam, anybody who had just an a itching on his buttocks, it's like, well, I, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, this is easy. Anybody could do it. Yeah, any, any fool can turn on a computer, get a camera, put it up there, and go off on something. Yes. But is the Lord behind it? Is the Lord the one giving you what to say? Huh? Huh? Like I said this morning in um, Converse with my a dearly beloved brother, a friend, a great friend, a friend who has been with me from the beginning. A beloved friend. Um, Lord puts us together, us blokes together, and like I said, Lord gives us stuff, okay? And Jeroboam, anybody who just, it's like, oh, that looks like fun. I'll try it. You know, I'll be honest with you. I often don't enjoy doing this <laughs> I'm, I'm just being honest um it's praise the lord praise the lord but um I'm, I'm gonna have to give an account for everything i've said to you so are you hot shot and we, we got to remember that you know, remember, false prophets, they run to be in the forefront. Someone who has truly been called of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, of the Church of the Living God, it's like, uh, you, no, no, I don't want to do that. 
No. But then he takes everything away. He closes all the doors. It's like, I want you to do this. Are you gonna are you gonna obey me? You want me to take more away from you? Verse 34. And the stigma that stuck with Jeroboam to this very day, the Catholic month of December, December 1st, 2021, 1048 a.m. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. Jeroboam made the children of Israel to sin. He ordained just anybody. A lot of these easy believers and heretics just coming up out of the woodwork, led by their father, the devil. And then you've got those of the church of the living God button heads over dumb issues. Yeah. Ezekiel chapter 14. We're almost done. We're almost done. Like I said, I love you. I'm not concerned for your time. I'm concerned for your time in the eternity where you're going to go. Okay? Concerned for how you walk. I'm concerned for how I walk. Okay? But, um, you know, I'm not concerned about, you know, how, about your time. You know? You watch one of these videos the Lord has me to do? Um, this is how it goes. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 on to verse 10. See, this man of God was way too quick. Okay, he, re he rejected the king, but when someone came saying, I am of you, I am one of you, I'm of the church of the living God. God told me to tell you. Or no, how do they say it? Oh, I'm a Christian like you. God spoke to me to tell you. Yeah. And when you look in the history, um, what one institution is linked onto virtually every single war in history, the Roman Catholic Church. You lost people again. You lost people who contact me. <laughs> and a lot of you, you say you don't want anything to do with Christianity. Yeah, because Satan has destroyed what Christianity might have been in the past. I don't want anything to do with it. How about you? Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 on to verse 10. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Stumbling block. Like this old prophet did unto this man of God, put a stumbling block in there, and the man of God didn't uh, go to the Lord when the Lord was speaking with him directly. He didn't go to him. He just fell for it. Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, now the prophet came to the man of God, I the Lord will answer him that cometh to the multitude, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Like I said, if you fasted before, you know that craving, that hunger, that, that thirst, that, that mung mouth thing that you get going on when you haven't drank or eaten anything for 24 hours, if you've ever done that, okay? You know what that's like. The, the man of God, he, sure, Lord said, don't eat, don't do anything. The way you came, go a different way, okay? Yeah. Could he have been secretly wanting, yearning to eat? If any of you have fasted, you know what that's like. That's why you keep the scriptures that the Lord will guide you in the scriptures while you're taking your mind off of your hunger and your thirst will satisfy you, quicken you in his word when you have no other distraction. See, 
distraction. See. That I may take the house of Israel in their own heart. Because they are estranged from me through their idols. Therefore thus, therefore say unto the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from your idols. And turn away your faces from all your abominations. Does idols just specifically mean a statue? Come on, dude. Come on. Does idols just mean a statue? In specific context, yes, there are certain areas, yes, where it's specifically talking about statue, statues, yes. But what does Paul call idolatry? Things like covetousness, you know? So, what is an idol? Yes, it's a statue. An idol is something that takes the place of God. To relegate an idol to having only one interpretation, one meaning? Well, the context says, yes, we're aware of that. We're aware of that. But something that is an idol is just a statue? Come on, dude. Come on. Fetching at straws, dude, man. And turn away your faces from all your abominations. For everyone in the house of Israel or the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart. And putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face. And cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Wow, that ought to scare you. And I will set my face against that man. And will make him a sign, like we looked, okay, like we saw kind of here in 1 Kings chapter 3, 13. Uh, and I will set my face against that man. And will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing. I the Lord have deceived that prophet. And will stretch out my hand upon him. And will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. God will allow people. You, you on your own time. Check 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 1 on to verse 28. Not going to read that all today, okay? Because I can only do three hours here, okay? <laughs> but, okay, when it says God will deceive that prophet, they have not received a love of the truth. Therefore, God shall send them strong delusion, okay? King Ahab, like in uh, 1 Kings chapter 22, had a whole bunch of false prophets telling him what he wanted to hear. And he deceived those prophets because they didn't want to hear the truth. But they wanted to believe in a lie. So when you want to believe in a lie rather than the truth of Scripture, careful what you ask the Lord for. <laughs> he might give it to you. So that's what that means, okay? I'll deceive him. He will allow him to be deceived. He will send them strong delusion, okay? He will choose their delusions. You don't want to believe me? You don't want to believe the truth? You want to believe in a lie? Okay, here, go ahead. Sop up all this nonsense. Sop up all this heresy. Yeah, go ahead. Eat it greedily that you're a good person, that you saved yourself by your own belief, or that you don't sin anymore. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You want to believe that garbage? Go ahead. Go ahead. Here, here's a little, like, what uh, <coughs> what uh, Jacob did on the Esau. Esau only asked for a bowl of soup. But what did uh, Jacob give Esau? He also gave him stuff to drink along with that uh, soup. He also gave him bread 
and water along with the soup. He gave him more than what he asked for. Right? <laughs> right? Okay? Let's continue. Okay, let's re re read verse 9 again. Sorry for that. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and will stretch out my hand upon him, and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from me. Neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. The word, and that, that'll be it. We were only supposed to read to verse 10, but you get the point, don't you? And let's go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And we will close here on Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Verses 19 on to verse 23. Acts chapter 26. This is Paul before King Agrippa. A lost man referring on to someone of the Church of the Living God as a Christian. <laughs> Acts chapter 26, verses 19 on to verse 23. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. The man of God that we have already looked at in 1 Kings chapter 13, he was disobedient unto, not to the heavenly vision, but God gave him specific directions. He was deceived by the old prophet. But the man of God, excuse me, should have gone to the Lord. It's like, Lord, you told me one thing. This guy's saying, who heard it from an angel, by the way, tell me something else. Lord be like, what's wrong with you? But did he do that? No. Verse 20. But shoot first unto them of but shoot first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue until this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which, they, which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should raise from the dead and shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So the point is, brethren, Um, go to 2 Corinthians again 2 Corinthians chapter 11 2 Corinthians chapter 11 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 and 4 again would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, he might well bear with him. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, has made the way of salvation very plain 
It's very simple. Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Come to him on his terms, broken and contrite. And in fear of the Lord, call upon his name and may he save you. It's simple. The hard part is you being broken. You got to get over yourself. And you know, brethren, until the Lord provides for you a check or a rebuke or, or whatever manner, whatever it is, Okay, you got a brother or a sister rebuking you. Okay, like when brethren have rebuked me, they'll be too, they'll go to the scriptures. But you know what I do? I say, like, I hear you, brother. I hear you, sister. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray about it, and I'm gonna ask the Lord, show me show me my error, show me where I'm wrong, and Lord. Rebuke me, correct me, chasten me. And if I'm wrong, show me. And until he does that, and until you search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so, go forward in the confidence that you are doing what the Lord would have you to do. Until he send a rebuke and a check or something, and you personally go to the Lord about it. You don't go to someone else and say, pray to the Lord for me to see if this is his will. No, you, you go to the Lord personally to see whether or not it's his will or not. That's the point. How many people out there today with this, this ridiculous Omicron thing now, oh, man? When I first heard about that Omicron thing, I, I mispronounced it, Omnitron. It's like, what? They got a transfer? They're naming this stuff now after the Transformers? Hey, you Jesuits, uh, the next uh, variant that comes out, name it Optimus Prime B, please. You know, you got Omnicron. It sounds like a Transformer, a kid's toy, okay? But you got people out here nowadays. You are the Church of the Living God, okay? Get the vaccine. Oh, excuse me. Take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. Okay? Steel of the Jesuit poniard. Take it. Go ahead. Search the scriptures, whether those things be so. You're of the Church of the Living God, and you're wondering whether or not the Lord has called you to be in ministry. Like I truly believe a certain beloved brother from Croatia might be be being called to, but that's, what do you do? Search the scriptures daily, whether that thing, whether these things be so. Search the scriptures, whether these things be so, brethren, that's the point. And if you know, as the church of the living God, if you know that the Lord has set you into a direction, and you know it, because he, he confirmed it through the scriptures, okay, He's confirmed it unto you. And you know you are doing what the Lord will have you to do. Unless the Lord give you a rebuke or a check and he also confirm it to you in the scriptures, continue on that path. Forgetting those things that are behind, press forward. Okay? So, that's going to be it for this video. This, um, this was an unexpected video. This was one of those things, another one of these videos where the Lord put everything to the side so that this may be taken care of. This, uh, like I said, this came as a result uh, from myself and a, a dear friend were able to have fellowship today. And like I said, when myself and this dear friend get together, the Lord just opens up things for the both of us. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. But that's going to be it for this video. Got some things to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all of you of the Church of the Living God who have been there for us, who pray for us, who help us. Because if the Lord didn't do it through you, we would have long been sunk. And being obedient to the Lord, it is what it is. I know what the Lord has called me on to. 
Do I necessarily like that? It is what it is. And I'm grateful for it. That of all people. There are some of you out there who are far better than I ever would be. But you're not. You're not going in what the Lord may have called you to. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. And seek the Lord. And he will lead you and guide you. Thank you to every single one of you who have who pray for us, who help us, who support us, who encourage us. Thank you. We love you. We love you very much. And on to you of the Church of the Living God. Um, there are those of you out of the Church of the Living God who um, I disagree with, who I don't like. Personally, I have no problem with those who are of the Church of the Living God. You're not my brother because you say you are. So, that's going to be it for this video. We love you, and we will see you in the next video, whenever that may be. Okay?